This week, I, got, I was asked, I was, I was glad to do it. I was, you know, glad to be of service, but uh, a dying woman needed some uh, questions answered, and I was able to be of service to, to put some verses together to answer these questions. And, I, you know, we're glad for every opportunity we get. Uh, but as I was sitting down answering questions and, and charting things out, when I was done, I looked down and I'm like, wow. I've got a seven-point outline. <laughs> it's anointed! <you> know? <laughs> but I thought, there's the message for this week. So next week we'll get back to John, but this <coughs> week uh, I, I thought I would go over this outline and, and talk about these things because, you know, people love to sit in the ivory towers and debate their specific doctrines and talk about the ins and the outs of this and that. And, but when, when death comes, when time's short, things get real. You don't have, you know, suddenly Joel Osteen doesn't seem like the first thing you want to watch on TV. <laughs> okay, stuff's real now. And, and you don't have time for pointy heads and, and talking about, oh, this is, you want answers, you want to know. So the, the crux of the matter in question, and, and I put on the, the top of your outline, salvation, assurance, and hope. How can I be assured of my salvation? How can I have assurance of that? Do I have hope, and what is it in? So that's what we're going to go over tonight. And, you know, we all need to ask ourselves, am I ready to answer that question? You know, for the people in my orbit, when your spouse comes to you one day and says, I'm going to be dead in six weeks, you know, or I've got this going on, are we ready to answer it for people that we love, and even for us? You know, what happens when you go to the doctor one day because you got a bellyache? Oh, you've got leukemia. Yeah, you know, I told you guys about the, the, the gentleman that lived at our house when, when I was a kid recently. The man runs a marathon. Two days later, his, ah, I'm not feeling so good, my side's kind of hurting. Two days after he runs a marathon, oh, your whole body's full of cancer. You know, it, it can happen like that, and we need to be prepared for when stuff gets real. Um, you know, and I'm glad we found out that you know they've they've done all that radiation and um, chemotherapy on him, and the last report he got, he's cancer free, which you know it's great for him. I thought the last time I saw him, I was saying goodbye, but um, you know, and that you know, of course, it can come back at any time, but it's it's good news for him. But uh, what happens when it's you sitting there? You know, what happens when you're the one in the hospital? And the first thing, the, the most important, basic, fundamental thing you have to deal with is how is a soul saved? How is a soul saved? You have to answer it for yourself. And you need to be ready to answer it for people that you run into. And the big mistake that... I've made pretty much every church-going person that you know makes is you meet somebody, you hear them mention the word Jesus, or you hear them mention the word church, and, oh, you're a brother, you're a sister, you must be saved. You, know, you just usher them into heavenly places without ever asking them a question, without ever even... You know, they've given you no evidence whatsoever that they've heard the gospel ever or even trusted it, but... You know, they, they go to church and they sit pretty close to the front of the building, so they must be, they must have heard the gospel, but it's, that's not it. You know, just because Bill goes to church doesn't mean you say, Hi, Brother Bill. Hi, Sister Sally, you work in the, sing in the choir. You've got you to gotta be a minister on that gospel because that's what the, whole, the devil's whole business is trying to hide it, trying to twist it, trying to obfuscate the truth of it. So that's why we need to be, you know, laser focused, razor sharp on what is the gospel. Have you heard it? Do you trust it? Uh, and that's so harsh. You know, people, they call me a closed-minded fundamentalist rube for believing the Bible. And that's, you know, being harsh and speaking plainly and openly, that's not the way to win friends and influence people. Obviously. <laughs> but that's what we are called to do. And it's not a harsh thing if you step back away from yourself and look at it 
Take yourself out of the equation for a second, your feelings. And, you, know. you got two options. You ask probing questions. You, what do you, have you, okay, you go to church. What, what does your church believe in salvation? You're asking these questions. You have two choices. One, you can offend a Christian on his way to heaven. I don't, I don't know many Christians who get offended hearing the gospel, but that, that's one option. You ask probing questions, you, you talk about things to the point where they maybe get a little bit offended that you didn't just welcome them into the, into the uh, kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of heaven, <laughs> heavenly kingdom. They may get offended, but at the end of the day, what's wrong? You've mildly offended somebody whose soul's saved. The other option is, I'm going to just, okay, Bill goes to church, that's great. Hi, Brother Bill. I'm going to not tell Brother Bill the gospel on his way to hell. It seems to me that there's not really much of a choice there. Now, I'd rather offend a thin-skinned Christian than not tell the gospel to somebody who's going to church. I, I came down front, I filled out the card, um, you know, I, I'm on the membership roll, I went through the class. That's the person who needs the gospel because they're in church, they've been told to do all these things and they're trusting their own works. That's the per So, always when you're ministering to people, always start with salvation. There's no reason to argue doctrine with somebody who's not even saved. It's, you're wasting your time, you're wasting their time, you may be wasting your opportunity to get them the gospel. So always start with that. And of course in your own life, what am I trusting? Am I trusting Christ alone or am I tr trusting my own works? Get that settled. It's the first thing to deal with. Now, we know how a soul is saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, we know what the gospel is. The good news is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Ephesians 1, 13, we're saved by hearing the gospel... Believing what we're hearing and trusting it. All that happens in between your ears, in your own heart, in your own mind. No works. You hear it, believe it, and trust. So I, the answer to my question, point number one, how is a soul saved? I hear what Christ did for me. I believe what I'm hearing and I trust it. That's a great plan of salvation because I'm not in it. I can't mess it up. I'm not part of the plan of salvation. God settled the plan of salvation in the Godhead. So that's wonderful. His, when, when you're dealing with somebody who's wondering, well, am I really saved? You know, am I, I haven't really lived a good life and I've done X, Y, and Z and, or I've done something so awful that God can't save me from it. The plan of salvation was complete before you ever committed your first sin. Before 2,000 years before mommy kissed daddy. That's how babies are made, right? <laughs> That's what I heard anyway. But you hear that gospel, you believe it, you're trusted, and you're sealed. Sealed. Sealed means you can't get out. 1 Corinthians 1.17 Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of that gospel, that cross, Christ did it all. And the best thing that you can do, that I can do, if you're dealing with somebody, you're trying to minister salvation to them, you're trying to get them to understand the gospel, the best thing you can do is shut your big fat mouth. You just said preaching of the cross. Ask a question. Do you, don't ask, do you trust the death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sins? Ask, what is the gospel? Or they say, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? How are, how are you a Christian? I'm saved. How are you saved? Then listen. They will tell you exactly what they're trusting. Are you a Christian? Well, yeah, my daddy was a preacher and I got baptized at five. And, you know, I've been going to church most of the time my whole life. You didn't, you didn't hear the gospel. You didn't hear the preaching of the cross. That person just told you they're trusting daddy's pedigree. He was a preacher. That's got to get me closer to God somehow. And a water ceremony and church attendance. That's your point to say, what about the gospel? So always, always, always 
preach the gospel and listen first. And if you're, if you're going to be, if the rest of your life, if you're going to be an effective minister of the gospel to the people you run into, you have to realize that most people, church-going people, that you see, that you meet, have never had the gospel preached to them. They've had the cross mentioned to them, but not preached. They've had the cross around water baptism, and they've had turning from your sins. Turn or burn, says the Bible, never. They make repentance into turning. Well, they have um, the cross mentioned to them while hiding it with giving your heart to the Lord. What about um, they've had the cross mentioned to them while telling you to start your journey for the Lord and your life's plan. What has that done to the cross? It's an afterthought. It's hidden. It's part of the plan that mostly includes what I do. So they've never had the gospel alone preached to them before. That's where you come in. That's where you can be the one to listen for the water, for the turning, for the works, for the, I just opened my little heart's door. You have a door in your blood pumping muscle. Great. Remember, most people have had the cross mentioned, the gospel mentioned, but never preached. Um, second question, big one. How can I stay saved? Am I sure I'm saved? Salvation. I think this thing's going to fall over on me. Salvation is permanent. Unrevocable. You can't undo it. That's the next thing. When you've established the gospel with somebody, the very next thing, especially if they're up against it, you know, if they're up against uh, a big decision or an end of life or something like that, how, are, are you sure I'm saved? I mean, can I mess it up? Can I lose it? Don't go to almost every church in town to answer that question. Go to the Bible, uh, to God's Word rightly divided. Uh, turn over to, if you would, to Ephesians 1. Now, we've been, we saw these verses, you know, when we're studying John and in the past couple weeks, we see how Israel has to endure to the end and make it through their tribulation to get their kingdom. But the body of Christ, heavenly places, according to Paul, is a whole different ball of wax. It's a whole different thing. Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also ye trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So you're sealed with God's Holy Spirit nonetheless. It's not like, you know, you're sealed with the hot glue that held her costume together. This is God's Holy Spirit sealing you. But look at verse 14. And especially in light of all the churches that have you earning and working and doing your way to heaven and you've got to climb the ladder and you've got to follow Christ in order to make it. Look what God says the exact opposite thing to you and me. When you go buy something, you know, I found this awesome car, I've got to go to the bank. Here, will you hold it for me? Here's $200 earnest money. Look what God does. We're, we, we hear in church culture that's all about us doing something to, to get God's favor. God gave you earnest money, if you want to call the Holy Spirit that. God gives you an earnest payment. The Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of His glory. So it's not about us climbing our way to God. It's you, you heard the gospel, you believe it, you trust it. Here, here's your earnest until I can give you the rest of your inheritance. That's what God does for us. Talk about turning a religion on its head. God, here's my Holy Spirit. I have the rest of your inheritance waiting for you in heavenly places when you get home. Glory. That messes up a lot of preachers' sermons on Sundays if that verse would ever get through people's thick skull. 
Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, He sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now everybody hears about, Oh, I've got the Holy Ghost. That means I'm sealed, I'm saved. If I've got the Holy Ghost, that means things are going to be great. Uh, not so much. Romans 8. He's, it, things are going so well for Brother Bob over there. He must have the Holy Ghost anointing. Look at that. Uh, not really. Romans 8.22 For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but not us, I got the Holy Ghost. No, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So, just because we have the earnest and we have the, the Holy Ghost sealing us, that doesn't mean we're taking out of the pain and out of the problems that this world is going to bring on you. Um, so we see that sealing and that salvation is permanent, non-revocable. Well, okay, okay, okay. I see it's not about you doing stuff, but if you, if you stop believing, that means you're not saved anymore. Or you're a professor rather than a possessor. Who's heard that one before? Ah, 2 Timothy 2.13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. If you believe the gospel, if you trusted it, you were put into the very body of Christ. You were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You were baptized by God's Holy Spirit into that body. He can't take you out. You're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh now. Even if you decide not to believe. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about the plan of salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with you. But um, So that's salvation. That's when, when you get the gospel through to somebody, there's so much in our society about losing your salvation or working for salvation that you've got to deal with the, people call it OSAS, once saved, always saved. It's God saved you, he sealed you. So, okay, you deal with that. I'm saved, I'm sealed, but uh, pretty sure things are going really bad lately. Um, pretty sure God's judging my secret sin. You know, there's a, there's a generational curse on my family. And that's, that's why all these bad things are happening to me. I've got unconfessed transgressions. I've got shortfalls. Um, so it's, you know, just God's judgment abiding on my life. That's why bad things are happening to me. These are questions that hurting people are going to ask people like us. Hurting church-going Christian people. Why is this happening to me? I, I've done so well. I've served so many people. I've, I've got this ministry going and all these horrible things are happening to me. Why? That's where we come in. Point number three on the outline. If you believe that gospel, you're forgiven of all your sin. The one you'll do tonight after you leave, the one you did before you came here, the one you're doing right now secretly in your mind, you're forgiven. Romans 5.1 says you're at Peace with God. Think about that one for a minute. The holy, righteous judge of the universe that cannot ignore sin, that has to punish sin, you're at peace with him. Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth... Well, what do we do about that? Hey, he's gotten rid of my sin. Let's go sin like crazy. I'm forgiven of all of it. Why not? Oh yeah, you, you forgot to read the last part of the verse. That henceforth, from now on, we should not serve sin, which Christ had to die to destroy your body of sin. So it's, people like to go, you know, and it, that's the wonderful thing about the grace message. It lets you know exactly who people are. You preach grace, you preach a proper understanding of the gospel, who you are in Christ, and people make their choices. Suddenly the person that acted all holy and wonderful and when they find out God's not going to judge them, they go do what their flesh wanted to do all the time. They've told you exactly who they are. Some people like me, you find out you're not, you know, you find out the deal, and it's like, wow, now I want to go to church. I want to serve him. I want to, you know, I never wanted to give money until I found out that I was not under the law and didn't have to tithe. I mean, but that's what grace does. It lets it, people show you exactly who they are. So that's what's wonderful. 
Uh, Colossians 1.12, you're forgiven all sins. Giving thanks to the Father which hath made us dirty, rotten, no good sinners, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's a pretty good change. Starting from child of the devil, now you're a uh, saint in light, like that. Who hath delivered. See how it's past tense? It's not like, if you endure to the end, it's, it's already done. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. That's behind me. Done with that. And hath translated, another past tense, into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, some sins, you know. That was your past sins. Now God's still going to judge you for your future sins. No, 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 no. Colossians 2.13, we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh. He's quickened us together with him, having forgiven us, or forgiven you. Little three-letter word. Messes up a lot of theology books. Irritates a lot of preachers. He's forgiven us all trespasses. Blotted out the handwriting of ordinances against us and nailed it to the cross. We already talked about the inheritance. You, know, you have an inheritance. God says, here, here's my Holy Spirit. That's a down payment on your inheritance. You have a guaranteed inheritance. And destination. Predestination, what's that? You have a foreordained destination if you've trusted the gospel. You will be going to heavenly places. You can think that you're a king's kid and you're Israel, and you're going to stay on the earth and run the earth with Jesus, that's fine. You're wrong. <laughs> if you are saved today, if you've trusted the gospel of the grace of God, you are going to heavenly places. That's why God calls us ambassadors here on earth. Ambassadors don't live or don't work at their homes. They work in other people's homes. That's what we're doing. Uh, Ephesians 1.3, God blessed us with all spiritual blessings where? In heavenly places. Ephesians 2.6, he's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you're as good as there with your chair at the table with the Lord. That's a pretty good deal. Can't lose it. In the ages to come, he's going to show us, we talked about we have the down payment of the inheritance, he's going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us. By grace you are saved. Paul talks about uh, in 2 Timothy 4, being preserved from every evil work into his heavenly kingdom, the kingdom in heavenly places. So that's a nice thing to know when you're dealing with people and especially trying to get them to understand their Bible, that you're going to heavenly place. You trust the gospel? Great. You can't lose it. You're sealed. No, he's not judging your secret sin. He's forgiven you all sins. And you're going to heavenly places no matter what. Number five. This is one when, when you get the diagnosis. You're immortal. Really? You, know, you think about all the, the video games and the, the uh, TV shows. What was that one with the Scottish guys, the Highlanders? I'm immortal until I get my head chopped off. <laughs> then I'm dead. <laughs> we are immortal with or without our heads. <laughs> our head, you know, Isis comes, finds me, puts my head on my chest like they do everybody else. I'm immortal. All you've done is kill my earth vehicle. I am immortal. I will live forever. 2 Timothy 1.9 He's called us with a, saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Uh, verse 10 but, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Life and immortality. I'm never going to stop living. I'm going to change the body I'm in one day, but I will never die. It's pretty awesome. I have eternal life right now. 1 Corinthians 15. If you've never listened to 1 Corinthians 15 on tape, you know the guy that does the whole Bible and he's got that beautiful voice and the baritone and all. Find that guy. Just sit there with your spouse and listen to 1 Corinthians 15. Awesome. But in verse 54, So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 
And then you do a touchdown dance in front of death's face. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? What now, death? I'm immortal. It's pretty awesome. It's a pretty awesome thing to know. Uh, not only for yourself, but in ministering to other people when they understand the gospel. Point number six. We'll hurry here. Death, physical death, makes you better off. What about my best life now? You're better off after your death. We'll read this real quick. I'm, I'm moving through this fast enough. We'll be done. Philippians 1.20. Paul's talking to the Philippians, and he's... You don't run into people that talk like this. He's talking about, you know, he's, he's, had a, he's having a hard time. Christ shall be magnified, verse 20, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So whether they kill me or whether I make it out of here alive, Christ is going to be magnified. Verse 21, who sitting where you're sitting right now can say this next sentence and mean it? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You can say it. I just don't believe you. <laughs> I mean, you talk about how heavenly minded and how Christ centered you are. I can walk out on the street and get hit by a bus. Sweet! Bonus! Maybe one day I'll be there. You know, I'm sure the closer you get and your body starts wearing down and everything hurts all day, it gets a lot easier to say, uh, yeah, getting out of here would be better. But, you know, I'm in my 30s. I'm immortal. In my, it's, I could say it, but I, I, I'd probably be lying to you if I said I, I really meant it with all my heart and all my emotion. You, know, you still have that old man that wants to survive, wants to live. It's not all under the feet. But verse 22, it gets even more weird. Or verse 23, I'm in a strait betwixt two. I'm having a hard time, guys, because I want to die. I desire to depart. And to be with Christ, which is far better. I'm really having a hard time, guys, because, you know, I really want to die. I'm not there yet. So I have so much to do for the Lord while I'm here. Yeah, that's it. Really holy. No, I'm just not there yet. But his, his straight betwixt two is, you know, I want to be with the Lord. I want to be dead. It's far better. But, you know, I want to be here to help you guys out, too. So... That's something to, it's going to take, it'll probably take us our whole lives to, to get that in our heads. That it's far better. But 2 Corinthians 4, you know, this is a good verse when you're dealing with somebody who's really hurting. And all the faith healers have failed. And all the preachers that told them to claim this promise and that promise. When that fails, when they're left with nothing. And everything religious people have told them doesn't work. That's where you come in with this verse and you could tell them the truth and it's not what they want to hear but it's the truth and it's a good way to minister to them 2 Corinthians 4 16 for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory so no matter how bad in light of eternity, it's light just for a moment. How many times have you heard the verse, your life is a vapor? It's just for a moment. Think about eternity. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For what you see right now, the things which are seen are temporal. They're light. They're just for a moment. But the things which are not seen are eternal. That's the only way <laughs> that you can walk through this life with thanksgiving and joy in your heart to the Lord serving Him because this world stinks. It's pain. It hurts. It, it's never going to get any better. It's going to get worse. That's the attitude you've got to walk through this life with. It's light. It's just for a moment. It'll be over soon. <laughs> Thank you, God, that this messed up place is not all there is. Finally. I hear you on that. I hear you on that, brother. I hear you on that. I see that. I believe that. But how do you know we have it all right? What about Buddha? 
trustworthy. You could trust God. I love the, um, the verse in 2 Corinthians 1. All the promises of God, all of them, are yea and amen. You can count on it. God's promises are yea and amen unto his glory. Titus 1, 2. The hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. I thought God could do whatever he wanted. If he lied, he would cease to be holy and cease to be God. He cannot lie. So if he says it, puts it in his book, it is absolutely not allowed to be a lie. You can trust God. And he's got a long track record of being trustworthy. That's what all these other scriptures are for. It may not be for you doctrinally. You want to build up your faith? You want to see how God is trustworthy and keeps his word over and over and over and over again? That's what all these scriptures are for. So these are all you know, wonderful verses that we need to know and be ready to minister to people too. Especially those who want to, you know, they're ready to face death and even for you yourself. You, know, you, never, you never know when one of us is going to go to the doctor. <coughs> I just ran a marathon two days ago. Oh, my body was full of cancer. We need to be ready. When the doctor comes in with the clipboard and the sad face to deliver my death sentence to me. You're full of cancer, Steve. We need to be ready for that. But, you know, I was talking with Melissa last night, and it's an ongoing conversation we keep having. I, I've never died before. I don't know if I'm any good at it. I've, I've never had that happen to me. I, I hope I'll do a good job. You know, she, you'll be fine, Steve. You'll do a great job. You're grounded, blah, blah. You know how that, those kind of situations, it'll be her that'll be the one that's completely grounded, and I'll be, oh, no, why? <laughs> but we, all of us are only going to do it once. We need to prepare. Prepare now. And, you know, I noticed something in, in this verse in Corinthians really struck me. It's great, you know, we prepare for death. We help people prepare for their own death. You know, that's great. But there's a bigger lesson to take away from it. You know, we have all these verses. We, we know how a soul is saved. We know what salvation is that it's permanent. I know God's forgiven me all sins. I know I've got this guaranteed inheritance. I know I'm immortal. I know I'll be better off when I'm dead. And I know I can trust God. What if, rather than take, take it off your deathbed and put it on you now, what if the day... 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road when you get the diagnosis? What if you'd been living all those things every day? You'd be a lot more prepared. It wouldn't be, oh, I got a cram. Oh, I got, what are these verses? Oh, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. If you look at back in 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll be done quickly. It's not my fault this time. We went over. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the next word. I mean, you don't get much better than that, being able to do the touchdown dance in death's face. Where's your sting? Where's your victory, death? What now? Look at this word in 58. Therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Therefore, my beloved brethren, because you know there's no sting in death, there's no victory in the grave, and that you have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, because of that, this is how you're going to walk. This is how you're going to live. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because of that, because you know all these things, you can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. So, put it down this way. What will your death day look like if you spend the rest of your life days knowing these things, believing these things, reading them, preaching them, ministering to them, making them who you are? What are you going to look like on your death day? I think it's going to be a lot easier. Well, 
I guess I'll have to prepare for death. How are you going to do that? Oh, the same way I've been living for the past 20 years. So rather than you, you could turn the tables. There's no sting in death. You're going to be the one ministering to people on your deathbed. You're going to be the one serving people and getting them to understand things and helping them because you know all these things. You know your soul's saved. <clears throat> Am I saved? Am I really saved? Is the gospel right? All those other churches don't... I didn't feel anything when I got saved. Oh, yes, because I know how a soul's saved. I know what the gospel is. You hear it, believe it, and trust it. Do that over the next 10, 20, 30 years. What if I lost my salvation? Can I lose it? Did I commit an unpardonable sin? Oh, was I ever truly a believer? Or was, oh, was I a professor rather than a possessor? No. Over the, every day, the next 10, 20, 30 years, I know salvation is permanent. I know I'm sealed to the redemption. I know I have that. You remind yourself that. Why is this happening to me? Is God mad at me? No. He's forgiven me all sins. You have that in your life as part of who you are every single day. And on and on down the list. I know we're, we're out of time here. but that's, that's what it's about. Knowing these things. And if you stay in this book, I know something about it. The word works effectually in those who believe it. So you stay in this book, you read these verses, you know these, it will work effectually in you. And the day that is going to come for all of us, 100% death rate still, I think we'll do a pretty good job at it. So that's all I have for this evening.